Welcome everyone to uh, our first seminar of the weekend. Uh, today we'll be talking Headphones 101 with our instructor, Everett Manns. Uh, he's a very well-known community member at HeadFi and within the HiFi community, and has served as a community manager at Deconi, Sennheiser, and most recently, Grell Audio, where he was recruited by Axel himself. Uh, we're going to be learning today about uh, basically the fundamentals of headphone technology. And without further ado, Everett Manns. Hi, yes. Hi, everybody. Everett Manns, I'm Shrug, as you aptly introduced me. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, so yes, uh, this is just basic, easygoing um, introduction to headphones. So if, you, uh, if you're new to CanJam, if you're new to the community, we want to go over just what kinds of headphones there are what kinds of drivers there are, how they operate differently, or <laughs> interpretive dance, or, and also uh, just kind of the advantages and what to listen for between um, like an introductory, like mainstream headphone, and what you can actually get when you start spending a, a large amount of money, why people will spend more than 20 or $100 on a headphone. And then we'll also be, have a fairly lengthy question and answer session, so I'll fill in any of the blanks, um, but overall, my content isn't going to be super long, so that way you're not overcrowded with too much info at once. So first up, um, we're going to say, like, why hi-fi headphones, right? Why is this matter at all? So in general, we have benefits that uh, you may have heard of, like, HD TVs, um, high-definition te TV televisions. That is actually, uh, and also Wi-Fi, were inspired by hi-fi. So high fidelity uh, music is more true to the original source, brings out more of the recording of that studio, more of that feeling of you know, being with the artist. Um, there's also, when you have a higher end headphone, there's better matching between the left and the right ear, because when they present like the same sound and it's very balanced, you'll have a sound that seems to come from directly in front of you and maybe even have a sensation of being outside of your head instead of centered inside of your skull. <laughs> um, we also have more sophisticated and consistent tuning methods. So if a reviewer buys a product, you're probably going to get more of the exact same sound when you purchase it. And unit to unit to unit will sound more the same. Uh, there's also uh, shorter ringing and decay. We'll get into vocabulary terms a bit later, um, but essentially the sound is more crisp and it's an easier uh, uh, listen to get more into the uh, insight into the music. Also we'll be talking about separation, sound stage, and imaging about how, again, outside of your head kind of feeling. So I had originally made a joke in uh, SoCal about frequency response charts. I don't know if you've seen any of these images, uh, and of course I'd love to show you mine. Oh wait. Uh, but uh, you'll see people like breaking down different frequencies, like all the way from you know the base regions, uh, for you guys, they usually have it right to left, uh, low sounds, bass, um, up to high frequencies, and about 20,000 K is like, at the best of your life, you're 18 years old or 23 years old, maybe you can hear up to 20 kilohertz, but it's normal for people to eventually stop hearing some of these super highs. Um, so if you're 30 and you only hear like 15 or 16,000 kilohertz, that's still okay. That's still good hearing, and most instruments will have, you know, you play the highest note on a violin, that's going to be less than 16,000 kilohertz. So you're okay. Um, and don't worry too much about like, uh, a specific peak or a dip um, because when you do a frequency response graph it's playing one sound that is you know just in a rising pitch so it starts off uh, with a and it's when you listen to music it's much more complex you're hearing highs and lows at the same time they're mixing up with each other, and uh, sometimes they can mask each other in a pleasant way or a bad way. So frequency response graphs are a bit of a start, but the more you learn, the more you realize that 
It's not really a replacement for your own ears. All right, so <laughs> some animations here. We, next. All right, so next we're going to talk about tuning signature archetypes. This kind of relates to frequency response graphs, but generally um, you can have a lot of people say, hey, I want a balanced, realistic sound. And the truth of the matter is what sounds uh, realistic to one person or one type of room or one type of environment is going to sound different for others. So your mileage may vary. Um, so one common type is a linear or reference type of signature. Uh, this is like the studio headphones that try to have as flat of a frequency response as possible, which when you have a raw graph that's not compensated for a particular reviewer's ear or a particular Harman car target curve or whatever, it will actually have some dips and things. But this is trying to sound like a near field studio reference monitor in a recording studio. It's trying to sound like that. Whereas at your home with uh, stereo speakers, your walls and things actually interact with the sound, double up some of it, increase bass, increase um, kind of a nice warm, soft wooliness because you hear something echo as well as what comes directly at you. So at home with a hi-fi setup, it's gonna sound warmer and uh, a little bit softer and more uh, forgiving than a studio reference. There's also going to be, this is an important term, you've got dark versus light. So when a reviewer is writing a review and they say that a headphone is dark, that means that the um, highs, the trebles, is a little bit reduced. So um, that can be good for long-term listening, um, but uh, it also can kind of make things sound like they're you know, right up in front of you, there's not like that sense of directionality as much. Highs contained a lot of uh, very specific, detailed um, information. And then a bright headphone is just the opposite. A bright headphone emphasizes these highs and treble sounds. And then the opposite, the next dichotomy is a warm versus a cold headphone. So in a review, if someone is saying, this headphone is very warm, that usually means that the, um, the bass is elevated, or a cold headphone, there's a uh, reduced bass. So someone that wants to concentrate on violins, they may want a cooler sound. If they want something that is uh, very tactical, like if they're into video games and they want to very much concentrate on tactical details, they may want a colder sound. But if they're relaxing, they've been working all day, or they're going to be listening to music while working, they may want a warmer sound that's also darker, just so that you can relax and listen without ear fatigue. <coughs> Next up, we've got the, uh, the V-shaped and the um, N-shaped graphs. <laughs> so one of my uh, friends is a music producer, and he says that in the V-shaped graph, uh, you want to make it smile. <laughs> so that's a reduction in the mids or a emphasis in the bass and treble. It kind of works out to be the same, because it's all this kind of a balance, right? So the extremes of the frequency response, your bass, especially the sub bass, and your treble, especially your super treble, are kind of like the fireworks and the exciting flavor of your music. Whereas the mid-range is where your guitar, your vocals, your violins, your most of your instruments are living and playing in that mid-range. So when you emphasize the sounds that aren't as frequently heard, it could be more exciting. Uh, it can also be very distinctly um, a coloration that's not natural. Some people love it, tell me sweet little lies. Or it can be um, just really fun. Whereas an N-shaped frequency response emphasizes those mids, emphasizes those instruments, rolls off some of the extra stuff like the sub bass, the room reverberations, um, and lets you really focus on details. Usually those aren't for uh, musical enjoyment, a lot of times that's for analysis. If you want to like a recording engineer trying to listen for problems. All right, and then there's also some industry terms. So if you're really into measurements, um, 
probably not the first place to go as a beginner, but if you're reading reviews, a lot of reviewers are very advanced, and they like to talk about diffuse field measurements, free field measurements, and then there's also the Harmon curve. Uh, now, a lot of people really, really like the Harmon curve right now. The Harmon curve is basically a, a bit of a V-shape uh, smile, but uh, Harmon Research did a lot of work to compare a lot of different people's listening preferences, and based on their listening preferences, listening at a home hi-fi setup, they like the lecture bass, they like a little less mids, they like a little more treble, but not that much. And it's a very specific average of what a lot of people like. But that average may not match what your preferences are, but it's a decent starting place. Um, a diffuse field is funky, it's weird. This room, I would say, is a fairly diffuse field type of situation. You hear me talking, I'm hearing my microphone coming back at me. Uh, the, wall, the sound waves are bouncing back and forth across all the walls. And um, sometimes you want to emulate that in a headphone or a speaker. So you can either use programming to do that or a softer sound. And uh, free field is like an anechoic chamber. I don't know if you've seen pictures of these things, but it's like felt and spikes all over every wall. Sound hits it and it's like, you know, it either is absorbed by the wall or scattered in such a way that it's so weak by the time it gets back to your ear that you don't hear anything except directly from what the speaker is. And headphones can be tuned to emulate what your ear hears by the time any of these kind of room conditions reach your ear. And again, we're gonna have questions at the end. Um, so, you know, if you want me to elaborate on any of this, cool. If I'm putting any of you to sleep, sorry. <laughs> so next up, we're gonna get to a couple more dictionary terms. Um, and again, this is gonna be really useful when you're reading reviews. Uh, you might have seen some people mention timbre, that's spelled T-I-M-B-R-E, -E, or timber sometimes, but it's pronounced timbre. Timbre is not the same as frequency response. Timbre specifically is uh, the character and tonality of an instrument like a viola, which is a little bit larger than a violin, playing the same note as the violin. That timbre is a bit of that difference. Um, so, timbre versus pitch, which is that frequency response, and versus intensity, which is like how loud, how much amplitude there is. Next up, uh, there's separation. Separation is very key. Separation is something that you get more of the better your headphone is. Separation lets you hear multiple instruments playing at once, and they don't seem to mesh together as like a wall of sound. It's instead being able to distinguish different layers. Uh, maybe you have that piano who's playing right up by the stage or by the microphone, but then, I don't know, glockerspiels somewhere in the background just kind of tinkling. Um, and uh, when they don't mesh together and they don't mask or bloom or muddy over some of those uh, other details, like the glockerspiels in our example, that's a headphone that has good separation. And if you want to listen for good headphones, you want to listen for good separation. Um, sound stage is a little bit separate of that. So with good separation, we can hear the different layers. Sound stage is that depth, that sense of distance. So maybe those layers are more spread out. Maybe you're in a venue that is really small or really large. Good sound stage, you can hear the difference between a large, a large recording room or stage and a small one. Imaging is more specific to the directionality. So imaging can be really wild. We can get really technical with computers and stuff to really precisely understand. You've got like a ray of sound coming in and it like kind of bounces off your cheek and then goes into here and bounces around in your folds of your ear and goes inside. So it can get really complex. Um, but, in general, imaging is that sensation of where sound seemed to come from. Sometimes also called in-front localization, but almost nobody uses that. Except engineers, and I'm talking to engineers a lot lately. Okay. Um, 
Cool. So we have three more terms. These next two are kind of uh, paired together. So there's attack and there's decay. Attack is like when you have a note, think about a sound like that. Attack is nothing, 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 and then the attack is how quickly you hear that response, that first hit of a note. Is it rolled off, is it kind of softened, or is it like sharp and crisp and distinct? And then decay is how much is left over and how long that sound kind of sticks around. Um, so uh, we actually kind of like, we're naturally tuned with our rooms like this to expect a little bit of decay. Completely flat and completely no decay is a little bit sterile, a little bit dry, a little bit uh, like, the life has been sucked out of it. Um, whereas something with a little bit longer of a decay, with speaker reviews, you'll hear people say that they're more wet, but it just means that the note has just a little bit more of a softer roll off, a softer uh, de decay. And then lastly, or no, okay, sibilance and slam. <laughs> sibilance and slam are both aspects of too much of a thing. Uh, although slam can sometimes be good, sibilance, almost everybody agrees, is not good. Sibilance is not more treble. Sibilance is specifically, um, hi, welcome, uh, like S and T and other uh, sounds that we call plosive sounds that seem to stick around. So it's when kind of a particular kind of sound catches and extends and seems to have too much decay and it can be kind of irritating and because it's a higher pitch, um, higher pitches make us tired and our ears a little bit tired quicker. So we generally don't like sibilance. <laughs> um, but you can have a headphone that has a fair amount of highs and where those S sounds are, you know, S, S, you know, you can do an S at any pitch. It's not necessarily tied to a particular pitch. And then slam is um, an emphasis in like mid bass. So it really gives you that sense of like a, a weighty, high body feeling. Um, so slam, a lot of people just like it. And the more you hear it, the more you kind of get addicted to it. But uh, it's also, sometimes it can be overdone where it overshadows everything else. Um, so, you know, a careful sense of slam. A good bass will have an exciting sound that you like. So people like more, some people like less. Without masking and having a bleeding over the rest of the sound and blocking those details that you want to hear. So, so what's the difference between slam and just the impact on a bass that is the same thing? Well, so, yeah, great question. So a slam is just like kind of like amplitude, right? Slam is just how intense and loud that particular low frequency bass noise will be, whereas attack uh, is how crisp it is. So it can be crisp and quiet, or it can be crisp and loud. Is that good? Cool. Yeah, glad to interact. Uh, and we do, I do want questions at the end, but if you guys got one in the middle and I can do it better, let me know. All right, so now let's talk about, I've mentioned a lot about headphones, let's talk, or speakers, let's talk about headphones. So there's a couple basic types. You've got open back and closed back types. And that's like the most fundament fundamental difference between headphones. An open backed headphone is trying to reduce the effect of the enclosure, whatever is holding that speaker to your head as much as possible. Make it transparent, make it just sound like you got a speaker right here. <laughs> Whereas a closed back headphone has got a shell and they're trying to block outside noise and help isolate you from distractions. Sometimes you don't have to listen as loud because you don't have to turn up the volume as much to compete. Um, so in certain environments, closed is great. But they both have challenges. Uh, with a closed headphone, um, sound travels in all directions. So when it hits that cup, it bounces off and comes back to your ear. So first you're hearing the driver, and then you're hearing what bounces off the cup and comes to your ear. And sometimes the cup itself vibrates, so it's, there's an echo, but then there's also the drive the back of itself vibrating and making extra decay. Uh, it's really tricky to do a closed headphone right. But if you're in a situation where you need that isolation, there's a lot of clever engineers working to solve those kinds of questions. 
Then there's um, different sizes of headphones. So this is where we're going to talk about most of what you're going to see on the floor is um, over-ear headphones. So they go completely around your ear. They don't rest on it. Um, they don't crush anything. They don't press anything. They go around your ear. Sometimes this is called circumaural because it's going around the circumference of your ear or uh, full size. <laughs> So uh, those are a bit bigger. Uh, weight can sometimes be a concern. Sometimes your shyness about being in public with a giant honking radio head on your head, you know, that could be a concern. But uh, these often have really high fidelity, really bounce signal, and they work with the shape of your ear the most. So you're going to have the most consistency between your viewers because they're used to what a speaker sounds like through their ears. And... Um, the headphone interacts with the ear the most when it's full sized. Next up, we've got on ear headphones. These are like the ear clip on ones, they're the portable ones, they're the smaller ones that just rest right on the uh, pinna in the outer ear. Um, and they kind of pin it down um, and press it back. Um, this, for me, I mean, you know, everyone, everyone has a different preference. My wife, this is her favorite kind of headphone. For me, I wear a headphone for like four, eight hours a day. Uh, my cartilage gets sore. It's kind of a preference. It is smaller, so usually more acceptable at the airport, wearing around your neck, you know, doing all that stuff. So it can be good, pros and cons. We also have the earbuds. So uh, who here has heard of the um, ear pods or the AirPods? We all, yeah, we know, we're not thinking about the AirPods Pro, but the AirPods, they just kind of sit and hook into the outside little cup and bowl of your ear. They don't go inside. Um, this means they don't form much of a seal. Usually you get a little bit less bass and they have to do a lot more trickery to kind of make it sound really good. But it can sound pretty good. And it's usually an N-shaped frequency response to emphasizing those instruments and mids. And a lot of people find them really comfortable. Um, last up, we do have the ones that are in-ear. These are kind of like earplugs, right? They go, <laughs> and you have to be careful with the fit, you have to clean your ears, but they provide some of the most isolation from outside interference. Um, they uh, have a really good uh, bass response. They have really good extended frequencies. Um, a lot of tricks can be done with them to get a very, uh, engineer intended sound. However, being in-ear, they don't interact with the uh, the bowl outside or the outer ear. They don't interact with your face. So they're the most variable on who the customer is, right? So my ears may be different enough that um, once it's in my ear, like something might sound good for me and not sound good for you because it's skipping all of the natural tuning that we've experienced our whole lives. So um, it's very important to try out a lot of in-ears and find the ones you like. It's also very important to get the right size ear tips. Um, that's why they always include like three different sizes or five, you know, more sizes and uh, people experiment with uh, like third party tips. It's really important. But that's essentially all the different types of headphones. Now I also want to check uh, how everybody's doing. Um, I was thinking about talking about driver types. Are you interested in hearing about what the difference is between like dynamic drivers and planers? Yeah. All right. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, this is the only video I have, but it's not a very big deal. It's a dynamic driver, and uh, dynamic driver is like that comb, right? Usually they've got like a bit of a cup. There you go. Well, he's <laughs> watching too, right? It's got that bit of a cup thing, and uh, it moves forward and back. The video I have is, it's kind of doing like a funky dance. Um, it's very important with a dynamic driver that it moves linear, it moves just straight back and forth. But if it gets any kind of wobble, that's called modal distortion. And that can mess with especially high frequencies and it can break up the sound and it's not so good. But that challenge, uh, that difficulty of making a really good dynamic driver has led to some really significant innovations. Um, companies that have invested a little bit more into their production, like Foster and Sennheiser and uh, 
like Foster's made a lot of headphones for a lot of different companies. Um, and uh, Sony has some great technology. A lot of these great bands have. So they may be one of the most common types of driver, um, but they're very highly advanced and they're difficult to make. Um, some of their benefits are that they, um, they have a flexible membrane around the outer edge of it, and the inside doesn't move at all. You want it to be stiff. Sometimes we think that that curve I was showing, sometimes we think that it's just like flattening out, but really that whole cone is there kind of like a corrugated roof or um, cardboard waves. It's curved so it's stronger and stiffer so that the whole unit moves as one. Um, and because it can move as one, the uh, and it's just attached around the outside edge, it can flex more and usually can have more excursion. That means that when you have a louder bass sound, it can move that slower movement, because bass waves, bass are slow, is like a slower moving wave, and it can move further out, so it displaces more air. And that's really good for bass. Go ahead. Just out of the blue, could you just explain a little bit the difference between when they, when they say fast bass as opposed to slow bass, which is better? Yeah, so and what's desirable? That's great. I should have added that in when I was talking about decay, um, because it's essentially that. That's a great question. So a fast bass, um, usually how fast that roll off is. So sometimes the bass is a strong impulse of energy, and that driver goes out, and uh, the magnets are pushing it. Because there's a permanent there's a permanent magnet on the back, and then there's a winding of uh, copper or sometimes aluminum um, around that cone, and the electromagnet pushes or attracts it back and forth. So when you have slow bass, it's going out, and then the, it was pushed by the magnet, and then it's kind of bouncing like a spring back and forth, and it takes a while for it to settle. So a slow bass actually doesn't settle immediately. And it kind of blooms and muddies over other so sounds. Say, so it would sound a little bit softer than the bass? It's, yeah, it has like a slower undesirable, decay. Undesirably soft. Well, Some people like it. It's a slower decay. Yeah. So like a room that has diffuse field and like you're hearing me and you're hearing, you're hearing me directly, you're hearing the microphone and you're hearing me reflecting off the walls, that's kind of a slowing effect. Um, so mentally it kind of sounds like a room with solid walls. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I'm just thinking, I mean, wouldn't you be more concerned with having that ambient effect in the recording itself? And that yeah, so the nice thing about a fast bass is that it's reproducing what the, the uh, microphone picked up. Um, and you have the flexibility that if you use com uh, computers and programs, you can always add in extra if you want that. Whereas a slower bass is going to have that color no matter what. There's some famous headphones that I'm not going to name, but you all know. Uh, that has, it's famous for its very chocolatey, luscious, sweet, like, oh, it's this gooey bass sound, but it's slow. So, yeah, it adds that kind of flavor to everything. It's kind of like remastering what the engineer did. If you love that sound and you want it and everything, some people do. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Ah, on topic. All right. Next up, we, we have to talk about electrostatic drivers. So that's very different. You've got a very, very thin membrane, and it's stretched taut and straight, um, and attached on the sides, and then it's in between two kind of like screen doors. They're like a, like a, a, a metal mesh. And these meshes, they're statters, they get electrically charged, and uh, so does the membrane. Um, and the membrane, by the way, is a feat of engineering, right? Electrostat, Membranes are sometimes a molecule thick. They're lighter than air. Um, very, very, very low um, inertia, so that they have very fast, fast base. <laughs> sometimes so unnaturally fast base that we don't think that they have base. Um, so they're they're suspended. They're it's it's attached and uh, in between these two fields of like electromagnetism, and uh, it's it flexes in between them and because it's attached firmly around the edge, unlike the cone drivers, the dynamic drivers, where it can move a lot of displacement, it can only move a little. 
Um, so if you know your Socrates and Eureka, or maybe it's not Socrates, maybe that's Aristotle, but if you know your water displacement and stuff like that, if you don't have much excursion, you can't move it as far. The way you make up for that as an engineer is to make a larger surface area, a bigger driver. So when it's bigger and wider, it can push more air, and it feels like more base. Um, and they have really, really low distortion in uh, mids and highs, so really crisp and clean with those higher frequency vibrations. Um, and they can be kind of some of the best headphones in the world, but sometimes the bass is so fast that we feel it's unnatural and um, not as pleasant. So wouldn't, wouldn't the larger surface area of the diaphragm in the plan on, or the electrostatic sort of enhance the bass? It, it, can, air push? it can enhance the intensity, um, but it won't make it a slower decay, unless you add it with programs. But even so, like, you have, like if it's an unusually um, subsonic, you know, sub sub bass high intensity um, thing, it actually might run into a limit where not only is it uh, like not able to move that much, it might even hit the stator in front of it or behind it. Um, that's sometimes a problem is that it has to be close enough to strongly move that membrane, but it can actually hit the boundaries of that. So, uh, you know, at higher volumes, higher bass, it can do that. Um, but it's a really good driver. Next up, planar magnetic. It's kind of a little bit of the electrostat, uh, but a little different as well. So uh, a planar magnetic also has a thin membrane and usually suspended between two sets of uh, repelling and attracting forces, but sometimes they just have one, like, uh, I don't know, Oppo did it. I think Odyssey has a couple single-sided arrays, but they have an array of permanent magnets instead of uh, that steel mesh electrostatter. They have permanent magnets in an array, um, and they have a lot of gaps in between them to try to let the air go through and the vibrations pass through so they can hear you. But it's a thin sheet with uh, electric traces embedded into it that allow that membrane to move back and forth. And again, a larger surface area helps with base, um, and it helps, it has a pretty good uh, high frequency response with low distortion, um, but it's a little bit heavier than the driver on an electrostat, and it is also a little bit less expensive to produce, so it's a little bit easier to acquire. You need less voltage also, right? Yes. Yeah, you need a lot of voltage to get a little sadder because it's, you're working with very infinitesimal forces on an electrostat. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, there's also ribbon drivers, uh, balanced armature, bone conducting, and MEMS. And uh, there might be some more that I haven't heard of yet uh, or haven't researched enough to tell you guys about. But these are less common. Um, balanced armatures are pretty common. Uh, but let's first talk about the ribbon because a ribbon driver is actually fairly similar to like a, a planer in a sense, but it's attached only at the top and the bottom. Um, so instead of it being like a square attached to all sides, it kind of vibrates like a, um, a string instrument or the bow of a bow and arrow. Um, and uh, they generally are, they produce their own response. You usually can't really tune the driver all that much. You can use the pads and the uh, enclosure to shape the sound a little bit, but usually what you get is what you get. Um, and I'll let Rawl and the people who specialize in ribbon drivers talk about it a little bit more. But it is an unusual type of driver, and it's kind of neat. People are trying new stuff. Uh, balanced armatures. Balanced armatures you usually see only in those in-ear headphones. They're usually very, very small drivers. Um, there's like a lever and a, like a plate that moves inside of this box. So an electrical force is, uh, you know, electromagnet and all this stuff is used to push a little plate, and it just moves a little bit. And it also, because it's in a box, it has a limit to how much excursion it has. Um, and then the air inside this box is pop piped out of one little hole, and that's sent to um, your ear. Now each driver usually because it's that limit of excursion, uh, it's very lightweight, so it does good with highs, 
but producing um, lower mids and bass is a little bit harder for that kind of a driver because they run into that limit of excursion. So to move more air, a lot of times they combine them with more um, balanced armature drivers. Um, so two drivers has twice as much air. Uh, they also, um, well, it, balanced armatures can be really good, but uh, you know, a lot of people are looking to combine some of these different drivers together in different ways and uh, utilize the benefits and advantages of each. Uh, balanced armatures are also really good, I'm going to mention, because they're very electrically efficient. So you need a ton of power for an electrostat. You need very, very, very little for uh, a balanced armature. So for a portable headphone, you want your batteries to last really, really long. Um, a, a balanced armature driver can usually be pretty darn efficient. Um, bone conducting is not new, but it is newly starting to get more concentrated hi-fi efforts. Uh, it, instead of it going on or in your ear, it usually rests on a bone in front or behind your ear. And instead of vibrations going through the air to your eardrum, vibrations basically make contact with your bone. You know, we hear a lot through our jaw bone as much as our ears. It transmits those vibrations through your ear until it reaches your eardrum. And then your eardrum vibrates your inner bones and things to uh, let you hear the sound. So you can have a bone conducting headphone that completely leaves your ear open and you can hear everything surrounding you like if you're on a walk or if you're working. Um, and then there you get this extra sound that's totally transmitted through physical contact and solids instead of gas and air. Uh, last up was MEMS. Uh, a MEMS driver, actually forget, it's like a mechanical electro, wait, it's an acronym. <laughs> but the important thing is that it's an array of tiny, tiny little drivers that are almost like electrostatic drivers or um, piezoelectric, where it's a type of material that just, when you give it a current, it flexes. And that flexing lets us push a little air. But each one is so small that a MEMS driver is usually like a dozen of these little tiny circuit board looking things or maybe 40 or 80 or 100, there's a lot of them in um, the speakerphone of all your smartphones or the microphone of your smartphones. Um, and it has to combine a lot of them to be able to create that displacement for a more lower end. And they're usually kind of limited to a frequency range. But there's some interesting experiments going on larger numbers, uh, different um, techniques to try to expand that uh, capability. So MEMS is that really esoteric one that you almost never see, but it could be seen more. All right, so I did a plug for my YouTube on Abstrug. I will tell you guys and Gerald that I have uh, rehearsed and practiced some speech, some things, and I do hand-drawn illustrations on my YouTube channel, uh, Abstrug on YouTube. A V S H U G. So if you forget any of the things and you wanted to see more presentation visuals uh, or just a reminder, a recap of the stuff I've talked about, check out my channel. I uh, did a whole bunch of videos and I'm going to do some more talking about amps and DACs and things. All right. Take, take a breath, everyone. I should have brought a water. I have water. I'm going to get it, but you know. All right, so we have a really great session coming up. Is it later, is it like two o'clock with uh, headphones, or amplifiers? Yeah. Oh yeah, Justin. Yeah, Justin with amps and sound. Yeah, it's a two. Mm -hmm. Two o'clock. So I'm gonna let him be the expert on that. But I'm just gonna give you some general um, tips, like if you're shopping, as it relates to headphones. A lot of people think that a headphone with higher impedance, I don't know if you've ever seen like the, the uh, Omega symbol, uh, and like, you know, 300 ohms or 53 ohms, um, that a lot of people think that's going to determine how sensitive a headphone is and how loud it can be, how much amp you need. But actually, um, it makes a very small difference, the impedance. It makes some. Um, and raising the impedance of a headphone is not so great. But, well, it can actually stabilize the sound in such a way that 
It's really well dampened against artifacts and noise and problems. So a higher one is actually easier for a amp to manage, whereas volume is, in a large sense, controlled by how much sensitivity. So if you're looking through the specs of a headphone and it says your sensitivity is like 110 decibels at one volts BRMS and such, if you see a 110 decibel thing, this is a portable headphone. This is very sensitive. It's going to have a very easy time being driven. And you're going to have plenty of loudness from the bass to the treble. Uh, whereas something 102 decibels, uh, decibels are logarithmic. So three decibels is twice as much energy, twice as much pressure uh, of pushing. But we hear twice as much volume at, uh, I believe it's like, like six decibels. Yeah, and then like 10 decibels sounds like, um, it was between six and 10, you know, it's not as, as an exact science, uh, especially because our ears are, you know, different sensitivities, different frequencies. So it varies. But um, 102 decibels, that's usually a more home headphone and it might be nicer with a, a more strong amp. Um, and if you have something that's less than 100 decibels, um, like, especially, I would, my, the, the headphone that I have that needs the most amplification and the highest crank up on the volume dial is a 62 ohm headphone. But the sensitivity is so low, I think it's in the 80s, that I just really, really have to turn the volume up on that. So if you're shopping for a headphone and you don't want to use an amp um, that's a you know, really expensive big one, Look at the, the sensitivity specification. Um, but uh, you can get an amp that's not very powerful, but it sounds really good. Uh, a higher quality amp usually has less distortion, less problems, less of its own um, remaster of your, of your music. Hi, welcome in. All right. Uh, I'm going to not show you this chart because it was a little bit too much kind of advanced anyway, but uh, the way that volts, um, resistance, uh, power, and, which is watts, and, in, and current relate to each other. But generally, just going around listening in here, you don't have to get that deep. Engineers did it for you. Thank goodness. All right. Good, I already talked about that. Oh, balanced versus single-ended. A lot of people are curious about that, right? Has anyone had heard of uh, balanced amplifiers before? We got a man. We got a couple nods. Cool. Do we want to? Do we want to talk about this? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thumbs up. All right. So this will also be good for um, amps and sound at two o'clock. But a uh, single-ended connection is what we've had forever. If you think about a circuit diagram, positive and negative, you got to make a circuit. Um, each driver has a positive and a negative terminal, in and out, if you will. And uh, when you have two of them and you just want one plug, uh, traditionally we've combined the positive terminals into like a ground, excuse me, uh, and uh, that gives us one ground, one negative for the left channel, and ne negative for the right channel. Uh, it all kind of comes together. Uh, with balanced, the big advantage of a balanced connection is, especially over longer cords, longer um, extensions, um, the signal, um, if you have a, a noise that's only happening in one channel, um, it actually will, they'll interact with each other in such a way that it kind of reduces and dampens some of the extra artifacts and extra uh, distortion on a balanced amp. Whereas a, a single ended amp just kind of lets it through. Now I will say that this difference is pretty small. You have to have a really well designed amplifier with the uh, left and the right channel, basically almost individual amps, have to have very closely matched uh, sonics. They don't deviate very much from each other. They, you have to spend for twice as many parts. Um, so if you're gonna do balance, you have to do it right. Otherwise, it's gonna be very hard to hear the difference. Um, but 
with a really good balanced amplifier, um, it should sound a little bit cleaner. Um, so if you're chasing that little difference that makes all the difference, sometimes it's there. Um, but nothing wrong with, like, there's some really, really well accomplished uh, designs that uh, the misconception, misconception about balanced amplifiers is that they're always more powerful than single-ended amplifiers. And quite frankly, that's not true. Um, like, if you can imagine two amplifiers being built to make a balanced connection, um, a single-ended amp can be as powerful as uh, you design it to be. You just supply it with more power. So, um, if you have an amplifier that is balanced and it has a single-ended option, it's usually only using half of those components, and that's why it's got less power. But if you have a single-ended only amp, you can design it to be as powerful as you want. And again, that's probably more something for, uh, yeah, uh, amps and sound. So I'm going to leave that for now. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about loudness as the last thing. Hearing safety. I want you guys to enjoy music for as long as possible. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I want to make friends. You, I want to build a community here. So uh, some kind of comparisons. A lot of people say, like, okay, decibels. What's like some common um, reference points for how much loudness there is or how much the decibels would be? So for example, a uh, normal conversation, not on a microphone. This is about 60 decibels. And it also doesn't necessarily travel that well. So gentleman, gentleman in the back probably doesn't hear me very well when I don't use my microphone. Um, but 60, this is about 60 decibels. Whereas a vacuum cleaner, is about 10 decibels more, around 70 decibels. Uh, a gas lawnmower, oh, that's 90 decibels. Um, probably good to start wearing a little bit of hearing protection if you've got a big lawn. Uh, chainsaw is 110 decibels. This is like, um, like I think if you, do, you know, divide 20 by three, um, you've got almost six or seven times as much power for 20 decibels of a jump. And then an ambulance siren is about 120 decibels. Um, and that can be really, really fatiguing kind of quickly. Um, a live symphony usually has a dynamic range between about 80 decibels to 102 decibels. Pretty darn loud. You know, they've got the shape of the whole room is a big horn, and it's amplifying the sound. So it's a between 80 and 102 decibels. You can listen safely for about an hour and 15 minutes, then you should take a break. That's why they have intermissions. Also, to give the artists a break. <laughs> a marching band is louder. They go from 85 decibels to 115 decibels. Uh, when you're hitting that 115 decibels, you don't want to listen for really much longer than 15 minutes. If you are a performer in a marching band, please wear hearing protection. <laughs> uh, rock concerts can range from 80 decibels to 120 decibels. So when it's hitting like that really loud sound and you're near the stage and you're near the PA speakers and it's going 120 decibels, you want to be listening for less than four minutes before you cause permanent hearing damage that you can't cure, you can't put in a hearing aid which is not going to make it clearer, or not going to restore your hearing. It's just trying to make it louder. So trying to make a normal conversation sound louder, but it's not making it better. All right, so this is our wrap up. We're just gonna talk about the types of listener um, and why there's not really a right answer for everyone. So some people like to listen for, to music because it's their job, like they're analytical about it, they're trying to find flaws. Maybe someone similar is listening for entertainment, but they're a purist. They're trying to get purely what the um, studio master uh, or the engineer who's listening to the different tracks and mixing them together, they want to hear what they hear um, and what was intended. Then there's also the emotional listener. They're just there to have fun, you know, tell me sweet little lies. They want, they want to, you know, amp up the bass, they want to like, you know, they just want to like, get like a feel it, you know, they want to get sweaty because they heard how intense the emotion was in that music. Oh. Um, I've actually seen someone, some people cry while listening to music and headphones, uh, that's, that's kind of cute. So, and they're there for entertainment. And what's wrong with entertainment? Um, nothing. 
There's also people that want virtual reality and transparency. It's a little bit different than analytical because analytical is trying to find, um, you know, the sneeze. They're trying to find the, the shuffle of the chair. Um, whereas someone doing kind of transparent, seeking transparency in virtual reality is trying to hear something where they don't even have to imagine to feel like they're in that venue. They feel like they're on a sonic vacation. And then there's also the collector and the explorer. They like lots of flavors. They go to the ice cream store and they get a different flavor of ice cream every time. And they just like to hear the different sounds. So that's uh, pretty cool. So generally, if you encounter different people on the forums and they have different tastes than you, let's be nice. We're a community. We have different tastes. We have different ears that literally will make you hear differently than them. Uh, more unique than a fingerprint. So let's be a good community. Um, be excellent, stay awesome. All right, so that's that's uh, my presentation. I'm open for questions. Can you raise it? If someone likes the M50X, is that an exception? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, honestly, like you could do worse. Uh, it's not the world's best headphone, and it's kind of like a popular meme headphone, but uh, it is, it is, we were talking earlier about like a slower bass and stuff like that. It's got that warm, slower bass sound. But for a lot of people, it brings them into the hobby, and it gets them into exploring and trying harder. So, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be down on it, but I get you that it's not the final head game for a lot of people. I heard a term, burn in a lot, online. What burn is, in? Is that something that should be done when you have a, a new pair of headphones? Yes. Yeah, well, so burn in. Burn in is a, quite a topic. Uh, burn in is widely accepted in the speaker and loudspeaker and home hi-fi community. Whereas it's a bit more controversial in the headphone driver community. Generally, uh, the, the idea of burning is that you play music for a while and you get like the mechanical um, parts of the headphone to uh, relax and be less factory stiff. That either this improves the sound or makes the sound worse, or whatever. Generally, mechanical objects have a lifetime. Right? So eventually things will wear out, you know, if you have a mouse and you click a million times, that button may stop working. Um, generally a headphone is designed to last a very long time. Um, Axel Grell's still got his HD 650, or 580 from the 90s. He's put some new pads on it, but the driver itself is still working great. As far as differences that happen over time, uh, most of the time the most obvious differences are in the ear pads as they kind of become more dense and they relax and they mold to the shape of your head. This can either bring the driver closer and make things sound a little bit more end shaped, a little bit more emphasis on that mid-range, um, and also sealing better uh, against your ear, the shapes and contours and bumps of your ear, so that can change the sound. Um, as far as the driver itself and burn in through the driver or the cables, uh, Cables especially is a little bit up for debate. I've had people recommend that I burn in my cables. Uh, the drivers, um, well, I mean, it's a mechanical object. It, it, they're probably, for most people, over time, it's a very slow process, and your brain will just understand all along the way, like, it will seem the same. Um, it's really hard to have the same batch production, same tuned headphone, because headphone to headphone, there's a bit of variance. You, know, you buy two different models in the same year, slightly different. Um, but I will say that uh, don't worry too much about burning, but it doesn't hurt. <laughs> and uh, there's, um, you know, especially after like the first like 10, 30 minutes, there's very little settling with the house that needs to be done. So don't stress it too much. Um, he, had, he raised it first, and I'll get you next, and then I also want to add, go back to you, but had some great questions earlier. Um, in the back. Does active noise cancellation help protect your ears against high amounts of death bullets? So yes. Pumping more energy into your ear, right? Yeah, it's, so, it's, so noise cancellation is a wave of the opposite kind of hitting its same uh, variant. Axel is here almost ready, which is great. Um, yeah, it reduces the amount of pressure and uh, decibels that interact with the ear, so it actually can help. Um, it also can be used not only for um, protection and isolation, it can also be used for tuning. So if you 
kind of counter some of the uh, driver's movements with um, an inverse sound. You can kind of nip and tuck and tailor the sound. Good question. Right. And then, uh, how much time do I have left? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yeah, he's doing a setup here, but uh, you guys, you guys have been awesome. Thank you so much for going with me, even though my...